The AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click Donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Professor Richard Conley, an expert on congressional and presidential relations, says Trump could be in for a rough honeymoon with Congress if he keeps villainizing people. The boss, Bruce Springsteen, tells podcaster Mark Marin that it is the people he writes about who are going to be the most negatively affected by a Trump presidency. And Bill Press talks with California Congressman Raul Ruiz about Obamacare and other topics. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Professor Richard Conley has a new book about presidential relations with Congress. This time, he says, they may not work out too well. And, he says, presidents who lose the popular vote aren't usually successful. And we say hello to Richard Conley, an associate professor of political science at the University of Florida. He's an expert on the interplay between Congress and the White House. And he has a new book, Presidential Relations with Congress. Richard Conley, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Nice to have you with us. You know, there used to be a a lot of give and take between congressional leaders of one party and a president of another. Is that dead and gone forever now that Republican leadership is controlled by basically extremists in their caucus? Well, of course, extremism is a is a a, a difficult term. And um, we hear that thrown about from one party toward the other and vice versa. I I, I think the the larger issue that you're putting your finger on is this change in the environment on Capitol Hill. Um, You go back to the Truman, Eisenhower, even LBJ, and, you know, presidents were able to work with uh, leaders of both parties. And and within Congress, these were people who would get up on the floor of the House and the Senate and castigate one another in policy terms, and they go and, you know, have a cigar and whiskey and go play, you know, uh, golf the next day together. They were friends. That that environment has changed so dramatically. Um, the backroom deals that everyone really derided Congress about in, in favor of openness and transparency has, in fact, had, had somewhat of a, a negative effect on the ability to, to do the kind of negotiating on personal terms that that was once the rule on Capitol Hill. So uh, I still think there are ways that presidents can uh, insert themselves into the process and try to smooth it over. Um, You know, Reagan, for example, uh, invited all all the members of the House up to the White House. He would give them jelly beans and cufflinks, and that sounds kind of hokey, but it did establish some some good relationships. Um, Even Barack Obama uh, went to Capitol Hill. It was a futile uh, endeavor that turned out, but but to lobby for for policies and uh, meet with leaders. And um, you know the Republicans did write him off apparently even before he got there. So I think this environment is a very tough one for whoever uh, ends up in the White House um, because those personal relationships uh, are, are fewer and fewer uh, and far between. We, and, you know, you, you mentioned President Obama. He and John Boehner, former speaker, you know, they supposedly had a golf outing that was going to be the, the you know, that great bargain. And, and Boehner's own party turned on him. Yeah, and I think that's that's the other problem that, that, that you're pointing to is that even when presidents and leaders, uh, say, of the majority opposition can get together, uh, now the rank and file members uh, will not tolerate or accept uh, some of these kinds of bargains that their leaders um, uh, try to engage in. And I can remember back in 1990, a perfect example, George H.W. Bush held a summit uh, with congressional leaders to try to figure out the budget, uh, the old Graham Rudman cuts that, that uh, were going to go into effect. And hammered out a very difficult deal, went on television, talked about, you know, tax increases, and, and that was it. You know, the media said, well, he broke his pledge. 
uh, no new taxes, uh, even though automatic cuts were coming down the pike, and 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 the, uh, the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party was upset because they thought that the the cuts were too severe. The Republicans said, "Wait, we're not doing any taxes," and the whole thing blew up, and the bill failed, and and it was a it was a disaster, as we all know. So, it, you know, it, it's very difficult now for, for the leaders themselves to go and negotiate with, with, with the president when they can't really make promises that they can get their followers to go along. That, that's a real conundrum. Mm -hmm. Now, let's uh, we'll, we'll turn to the president-elect. Can a self-anointed negotiating genius like Trump work his magic in the world of Washington and Quite frankly, would it be a good idea if his agenda prevailed over that of Congress? Well, again, it depends on, on the degree to which his agenda differs, say, from the Republican majority. I think you know much of what he would like to accomplish in terms of repealing elements of, of Obama's accomplishments will set him at odds, clearly, uh, with, with the Democratic opposition. Um, it remains to be seen how well in this environment in the 21st century on Capitol Hill that, that Trump's negotiating skills in the private sector carry over. Um, you know, we've, we've seen him go and talk to an air conditioning company in Indiana and, 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 and Ford uh, not to move their uh, uh, assembly lines down uh, south of the border, and he's been successful there. Um, but whether or not he is able to um, negotiate uh, with members of Congress and leaders uh, in the same way he was apparently able to do in the private sector, I think remains to be seen. And one of the things that I would be concerned about is that, you know, if there's any indication from the primary campaign that Trump ran, of course, the general election, he, he has a penchant to sort of villainize people. You know, Mitt Romney and he, of course, got into that great spat. Uh, and then, and then, if come back together afterwards. But um, when you burn bridges on Capitol Hill, um, they're they're not easily reconstructed. Um, and so, we go back to the issue of of Trump's tweets and and, and these sorts of things. Um, members of Congress, you know, are likely to take those personal attacks very, very seriously. And it's going to be hard for him to reestablish good relationships if he. If he uh, doesn't get his way and 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 becomes uh, overly critical, something else to look at uh, with Trump was he weakened politically by having lost the popular vote by so much, or strengthened by carrying Republican members of Congress back into office? Well, I think institutionally, for for his agenda in Congress, it was very helpful that that uh, he did have uh, at least some moderate coattails. Uh, of course, it remains to be seen what will happen in 2018 with the midterm elections. Uh, you know, one thing we know is that presidents have to hit the ground running, and they've really only got that two-year window before the midterms come. We've had plenty of reversals of control of Congress in the last 40 or 50 years at the midterms. Uh, I think in terms of the popular vote, um, we all know how the game is played Um uh, in terms of geography, of course, the Electoral College was a, a compromise uh, that the founders undertook uh, between sort of the impetus for a popular vote versus federalism. And so <clears throat> Trump did lose the, the popular vote. I think a lot of that is explained by the surplus vote, say, in California. When you have the unit rule, in other words, you win a plurality or majority of, of the state, you know, by 50% plus one vote, you get all of the Electoral College votes. I think Trump won, uh, I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton won California uh, with a surplus of something like 2.6 million votes. Um, and so I think some of that surplus comes from traditional Democratic strongholds like California, New York, uh, Illinois. Um, but I had a grad student a number of years ago who wrote a very intriguing paper about, at least at the time, the four presidents who had lost the popular vote but won the Electoral College, and uh, he was a very good historian, and he wrote that none of them was particularly successful going back to the to the 19th century, so um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Richard Conley, an associate professor of political science at the University of Florida. He has a new book out, Presidential Relations with Congress. Richard, did President Obama strengthen the presidency by using executive authority, or did he weaken it by failing to stand up to Republicans in Congress when he had power? 
Well, I, I think that that's a very complicated question, uh, and it, but it is the right one to ask. Um, I, I think the Republicans are particularly frustrated with, with his use of executive authority. The immigration um, uh, issue is probably the most prominent of that. And so, you know, they, they filed lawsuits. And so now we've got the judicialization of presidential action, um, you know, uh, strengthening. I'm not sure that's the best thing for uh, for the republic or for a democracy, um, having, having judges uh, figure these things out. But I think in terms of, of President Obama, it, it was a matter of not being able to get action on things once the Republicans um, took the reins of, of, of Capitol Hill uh, two years after he was elected. And so um, he turned to executive action in ways that, that you know, precedents had been established by, by Bush and Clinton and, 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 and their predecessors as well. Uh, and I think that's the temptation that many presidents feel when they simply can't get Congress uh, to act. Um, you know, gun control is another thing. Uh, one looks back at the Obama years and all the gun violence, and, you know, there's a there's a, a debate to be had about what, what can we or should we do about these mass shootings. I think President Obama took that very personally, um, and he wanted to get action, and uh, and interest groups got involved, members of Congress were split, and he just couldn't get anything done on this. And so he turned to the unilateral uh, presidency to try to try to make some uh, inroads there. And, of course, that's proven just as controversial. So um, it's, it's, again, divided government is a, is a tough proposition for presidents these days. Is Trump going to have a honeymoon either with Democrats or radical members of his own party? <laughs> well, I don't know, I don't know who, who, we, who we can put in as radical. Um, I, I think I think that that's it's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, I think Trump, in many ways, has this idea not completely different from Obama about how to stimulate the economy um, in terms of the infrastructure spending. Uh, and you're already hearing a lot of Republicans um, having, you know, issues with that, given given the debt right now. Uh, so that, you know, it, it only takes one or two missteps for that honeymoon to be eroded. Um, I think that Democrats generally on Capitol Hill, while they're, you know, skeptical of Trump, um, generally speaking, the opposition will give the president some latitude in the first three to six months. Uh, give him the benefit of the doubt, and then and then go from there. Uh, I assume that those Republican members who feel that they owe, at least in some measure, their success in 2016 uh, to Trump and his coattails will will do the same. Um, but honeymoons are a fleeting thing, as as, as we all know. Uh, when you get down to the real business of, of governing, um, you know, there's controversies. There there there. Are, winners and losers um and and that can evaporate the honeymoon can can evaporate fairly quickly richard conley associate professor of political science at the university of florida his new book president presidential relations with congress joining us today on america's democrats.org richard thank you very much for your time with us we do appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon well, my pleasure thank you you're quite welcome and this is america's democrats.org the weekly netcast for stand-up democrats we want you to sit back and listen to this americasdemocrats.org podcast a project of 21st century democrats but we need you to stand up and fight do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box you can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect democrats who will stand up for democratic principles Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. 
That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Bruce Springsteen bemoans the plight of the people he writes songs about under a Trump presidency. More on that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Bring those jobs back home. Donald Trump bellowed to those greed-headed corporate executives who have hauled our middle-class jobs out of country. Or... I'll slap you with a big tariff when you try to sell your foreign-made products here. Great stuff, Donnie. And to prove you mean business, I know just the CEO you should target first. Her name is Ivanka. Yes, your daughter. Her multi-million dollar line of clothing sold through major national retailers, ranging from Macy's to Amazon, are pitched to America's working women. Yet... Practically all of her products are made on the cheap in low-wage factories in China, Indonesia, Vietnam, anywhere except America. Imagine the message it would send to runaway corporations and the integrity it would establish for the Donald if he slapped his first tariffs on Ivanka's goods. But neither Daddy Trump nor the daughter want to discuss the embarrassing conflict between his political bluster and her ethic of runaway capitalism. Instead, she's tried to dodge the issue by saying it doesn't matter since she'll, quote, separate herself from the business if she becomes a White House advisor. Nice try, Ivanka, but the stench of hypocrisy will only grow nastier if you're at your father's side while he castigates and punishes other corporations that have absconded from America. The only way to salvage even an iota of moral virtue is to repatriate the manufacturing of your brand-name apparel. And bringing those middle-class jobs home to the good old U.S. of A. would also make a powerful political statement. But no, showing that money trumps both political savvy and the morality of simply doing what's right, Ivanka says her corporate brand will stay offshore. As a spokeswoman put it, we want to make responsible business decisions. This is Jim Hightower saying, really? How does that make America great again? Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We don't usually have entertainers on the program, but we have a special guest this week, courtesy of the podcast WTF with Mark Marin. Bruce Springsteen talks with Mark about the irony of the very people the boss writes about in his songs being hoodwinked by Trump. There was one bit in the book that like struck me just because of what we're living through now. There was a moment in the book where you talked about the high school principal encouraging the you know you had the rah rahs and the greasers and then the meatheads but you know there was a you know this was a high school thought but you know when you were a long hair and you were going to go to graduation that he subtly encouraged somebody to anybody to get you in line yeah you know which we now have a president elect <laughs> <laughs> that that he's that, a high school prince he's that high school principal yeah, the, the guy who's going to sick the bad guys on you like I can't do it myself but I'm not saying you should. <laughs> So and, somebody knocked that guy in the face. Right, right. That's scary. <laughs> not me, but somebody yeah, yeah. do it. I'll pay the bill. Yeah, I'm not even going to tell you to do it. I'm just saying it wouldn't bother me if you did. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, you know, it's like when I think about, I don't know, are you scared now? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, of course. How could you not be? Right. Is this, is this, have you felt this fear before? No. Right. I felt disgust before. Right. But never 
never the kind of fear that you feel now. Right. And it's simply the fear of, is someone simply competent enough to do this particular job? Right. Forget about what, where they are ideologically. Right. Do they simply have the pure competence right. Right. To, uh, to be put in a position of such you know, uh, in responsibility? He's so, like, when, you, when you've done the amount of self-work you've done and you've grown up the way you've grown up and you know, you know people, it's sort of like we, they elected the most insecure, you know, needy, yeah. volatile dude. And like you know, to to do this job like that that somehow or another, I don't think it like it it, it embodies strength to to a lot of people, but no. it does embody. Oh fuck you! Yeah, there's just like it's just they just voted for who are you voting for? The fuck you guy. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like in, in like, so I started thinking about like this weird thing about the themes of your music and, and the people that, you, you know, you empower and, and, and empathize for people in your life, your younger sister who, who live a you know, working class life. Of course. And, and times are tough. But, you know, that shift, and I think you might have suggested it in the book a little bit, that the, the, the strength that comes through, through faith or determination to deal with adversity is 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 that that's a celebration of the american spirit but once adversity tips into hopelessness however that looks and you've written those characters too you know and, and they've acted you know sometimes badly but when when the hopelessness you know has no place to go this is where we're at you're right so how how do you like where's your empathy around that you know i know people that voted for him you live in new jersey you probably sure. know a few of course and then you have that moment where you're like, well, who the hell are you? Who are you? I thought I knew you. Yeah. I mean, I understand how we got elected. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think if you were affected deeply by the deindustrialization and globalization, the technology, technological advances, and you have been left behind, that somebody comes along and tells you, I'm going to bring all the jobs back. Don't worry about it. They're all coming back, you know. And you're concerned about America changing, the browning of America. I'm going to build a wall. You're worried about ISIS. I'm going to, I got a secret plan to defeat ISIS. Don't worry about that. Uh, you're worried about uh, terrorism in the United States. Ah, I'm going to register the Muslims and we're going to ban. I mean, these are all very simplistic, but very powerful and simple ideas. I mean, they're, they're lies. They can't occur, mm -hmm. you know, but if they do occur, they can't lead to a better place. You know, it, yeah. It, but if you've if if you've struggled for the past 30 or 40 years and this has been the themes, the very themes of my of much of my creative life for all those years, uh, somebody comes along and offers you something else, particularly after you feel you've been failed by the, the two parties you know that it's a compelling it's a compelling choice and uh it it just appeals to your worst angels and under certain circumstances you know p enough people went there not a majority of the people but enough and what's your biggest fear of it as we enter it i suppose would be that uh uh a lot of the worst things and the worst aspects of what he appealed to comes to fruition. Mm. You know, uh, when you let that genie out of the bottle, bigotry, uh, racism, uh, when you let those things out of the bottle, they intolerance. don't, the intolerance, they, they don't go back in the bottle that easily if they go back in at all. Right. You know, whether it's a rise in hate crimes, people feeling they have license to, speak and behave in ways that previously were considered un-American and are un-American. Uh, that's what he's appealing to. And so my fears are that those things find a place in ordinary civil society demeans the uh, discussions and events of the day and the country changes in a way that is unrecognizable and we become estranged, as you say, you say, hey, uh, well, wait a minute, you voted for Trump. Uh, uh, I thought I knew who you were. You know, I'm not sure. You know, the country feels very estranged. You feel very estranged from your countrymen, you know. Yeah. So 
those are all dangerous things that, uh, and we don't even know. You know, he hasn't even taken office yet. And everyone's yeah. And it's bad. Those of us who panic are panicking. <laughs> yeah, you know. So we got to wait and see. But uh, but those are certainly the implications. And if you also look at who he's been picking for his cabinet, uh, it doesn't speak very well for what's coming up. Uh, you know, those are all things that that you know I'm very frightened of, and and waiting to see play out and all you can do is say well i'm going to do my best to hey america is still america i I believe in its ideals and i'm going to do my best to play my very very small part in in maintaining those are you writing about it no i haven't written about it you know it takes a while to digest all those things and even even and i don't know if i will you know because i i don't write i don't go okay the the, the, I need a Trump album. That's what's got to come. No, next. but 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 <laughs> but I think if you look at you, you know certainly your heroes and and certainly you know your shift into the power of of popular folk music and and what you know folk music meant. Like you know, it's interesting. Well, I've, I've got a lot of songs that are about it right now. I know. I know. You know, they're so, all there. That's done. Yeah, they're there. Yeah. You know, they're kind of there already. And and. Uh, you know, if, if I, I work from the inside out. In other words, I'm inspired by something internally, and I make a record based on what I can write about at a given moment. Uh, sometimes it ends up being topical. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, but but we've got a we've got a good arsenal of material right now that we can go out and yeah. sort of put in service of. It's interesting when you write in the book about the, the that there was an intimacy to the business, you know, whether it was uh, you know broken or corrupt or whatever. But you know where you had relationships with DJs, where where an article in the press could make a difference, where where a song. When you think about Woody Guthrie, or you think about the power of of that that music in those circles, how it could convey a message of unity. And I think a lot of what you talk about, you know, in your experience with uh, your fans and, and what music does, is that there there is a community. What's scary now. And I think you, you kind of point your finger out it a little bit is that it's so fragmented that there's now, you know, you can pick a world to live in. That's not the real world. That, yeah, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, as they say, it's your little bubble, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, New Jersey's a blue state. And, you know, sure. I certainly ran into more Clinton supporters than I did yeah. Trump supporters. But but uh, I did I did know both. And and uh I think if there's a benefit to what's occurred, and this was a little similar after the OJ verdict, was that people realized, whoa, there are some other Americans that are my countrymen that I simply, I'm not sure I know who they are. So the answer is is not to pull back into your little box, but no. the answer is, well, Let's find out. You yeah, know? one way or the other. You know, and yeah, uh, yeah, and, uh, we're going to find out. There's plenty of good, solid folks that voted for Donald Trump. Right. You know, as long as, as well as people who had other agendas, but you know, to to know that you've got to, I think you've got to know some. You know, and uh, I think uh, what it is, some a little bit is just this idea of change. You know that whatever they were afraid of, they voted their fear. Yeah. And but they they but the thing that's American that that is is sort of unnerving a, a little bit is that sort of like it'll be all right. It's gonna yeah. work itself out. <laughs> and then yeah. me and I'm probably I don't know about you, but there's part of me that's like I don't know. Like, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like you, it's shaking the faith. Yeah, of course. You know. So uh, so we'll see. Yeah, that's it. That's all we can say right now. Yeah. And- <laughs> we want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with California Democrat Raul Ruiz about prospects for the 115th Congress. Sean Spicer is the perfect guy to go and just yell at the press because Trump just can't. 
like doesn't have the time, I guess, to do that. Mike Pence, when he went to the Hill yesterday, I, you're not going to see Donald Trump meeting with members of Congress and going through the nuances of the replacement for Obamacare, right? Like he has someone to do that for him. Trump is no. just sort of going to kind of need to coast. Because- I, and I don't mean that to be, you know, uh, flippant. I, I just I don't think he really cares about this stuff. I, I mean, I always think back to that Robert Draper piece in The New York Times where allegedly uh, one of Donald Trump's sons went yes. to John Kasich, asked him to be vice president and said, you'll be in charge of everything. Yes. What will Donald Trump do? Be in charge of making America great again. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. I, I have no doubt in this world oh. that that's the oh. same arrangement he made with Mike Pence. Right. Very often, we just snag some member of Congress walking by on his way to work. Uh, <laughs> that's how it works. Senators, cabinet secretaries, members of Congress. Uh, uh, seriously, but we are honored to be joined this morning uh, by a good member of Congress from California, California's 36th congressional district, the great Coachella Valley, Congressman Raul Ruiz, reelected and sworn in again and back as a member of Congress. Congressman, good to see you. Good to see you. It's and an honor you, to be here. You had a very, very historic meeting yesterday um, with the President of the United States, an hour and a half. Yes. Uh, and I know it was that we meet, of the members of the media were not invited in. But what was the President's message to you, uh, particularly on Obamacare? Well, let me give you a, a little bit of a context of why uh, his meeting in particularly connected with me as an individual. I grew up in Coachella, right there in the Coachella Valley, and both my parents were farm workers. I lived in a trailer growing up. Mm. Uh, my uh, my older brother was the first to graduate from high school, and uh, a high school counselor paid for my college application because we didn't know how I was going to get to college, and my dad didn't know how he was going to pay for college. So I went around the community, uh, and I uh, would I wrote up a contract. I was 17 years old, and I would offer small business owners an opportunity. I say I'm offering you an opportunity to invest in your community by investing in my education, because I promise you I had one goal in mind that was to be a doctor and I said I promise you I will be a doctor and come home and serve the community and so they all pitched in 20 bucks 40 bucks Mm -hmm. I raised two thousand dollars that summer paid for a couple years worth of school books at UCLA went to Harvard Medical School the Harvard Kennedy School the Harvard School of Public Health after I finished all my training and my residency program at Pittsburgh in emergency medicine became board certified, went back home to fulfill that promise. And my life mission has been about health equity. And it's not uh, uh, a slogan that one puts out there. It's something that I have personally lived being on the other side of what it means to not have health insurance, what it means to to have family members who endure pain uh, because they are afraid that if they go to the emergency department, they're going to go bankrupt mm-hmm. um, or or you know grandparents who before was were so worried about having to pay for their medicine and just living you know not even check by check it's just like dollar by dollar and figuring out if they're gonna if they're going to eat the next day uh, because of those costs so when I went back home I started doing a lot of grassroots community organizing led a health care initiative uh, that uh, created a strategy to improve health care access, uh, started uh, free clinics with organizations like Volunteers in Medicine, started a pre-med mentorship program. And so this is before Obamacare. Right? This is before uh, Obamacare. This is before me running for Congress. This mm-hmm. is me as a community physician. Uh, and and you know I saw I saw seniors who after I would hold my community forums would walk to to big trash bins and and I being curious and caring for the senior I'd follow her and I said what are you you know what are you doing because I saw her digging in there and she said well I'm I'm collecting cans because uh, I don't have enough for my insulin. But they're like, but don't worry, doctor. I only take half half my dose, so it, so it can last, hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. You know. So 
or or like I taking care of patients who come into the emergency department, young women who who don't have health insurance, uh, who have had a lump in their breast for quite some time, but now that their sister's vis- visiting them for the holidays, they insisted that they had to see a doctor, so they brought her to the emergency department, and sure enough, she had a mass as big as a lemon in her breast, and who knows what that is, right? She she would have to go have a biopsy and determine what kind, how aggressive, but she's a mother, a mother of, of, of children, and it's these kind of decisions that everyday people have to make and go through that, 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 uh, that affect their lives and their f- children's lives, their parents' lives, their families' lives that are real, that people live with stress and anxiety out there. And so when I'm in this meeting, and now I, I find myself in Congress, right? I've never held <laughs> office before. I never wanted to run for office before. Um, but I'm in office so that I can help that young woman, so I can help that senior, so I can help my patients by fighting for health equity and all those social determinants that, that determine whether a person can live happy, live, live uh, with the freedom of poverty, uh, the freedom of anxiety, uh, and, and be you know, liberated to fully live their full, to their full potential. Uh, so I'm sitting in this meeting with uh, President Obama, with, the, with senators and other my colleagues in in, in Congress, and uh, and representatives, and and we're and he's talking, and and what struck me the most was the difference between this president and the president elect, because President Obama did not talk about his money, his fame. His his uh, he did not talk about uh, all the wonderful accomplishment. He did not once say uh, he did not once mention mention the word legacy. Um, what he talked about were people. Mm. He talked about uh, letters that he had read from people. There's no press there. There's no need to mm. to say things like this for to to persuade the American public to vote for him one more time, right? Yeah. Th- this is about him saying this is always about the people. And this is what connected with me because this is the only reason why I stepped aside from my my passion of practicing medicine as a physician in the trenches, in, in the community, uh, to come out here in D.C., leaving my young family. I got twin girls, 21 months, uh, oh, wow. Sky and Sage, and my, <laughs> my wife, Monica. Uh, and and I love them, you know, more than anything in this in, on this earth. But uh, but it's that it's that message to serve my patients to 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 help people, and that's what the Affordable Care Act does. Okay, it's not a it's not a a, a democratic flag or a partisan flag. It is a tool and a mechanism to help people live better lives. And that's what oftentimes gets forgotten in this political, ideological, partisan warfare that happens here way too often, that we forget about the young man who, have, who has ulcerative colitis, who's embarrassed to go to work because they have constant chronic abdominal pain or have chronic diarrhea, they don't know, and and they're insurance. And then on top of that, they don't know uh, how they're they're going to pay for health care. You know, before uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, their health insurance cost was way too high because it was a chronic illness, or some insurance companies wouldn't even take them. And now they they have insurance. They can afford their medication. They have the appropriate procedures. They they can go to work. They can feel like a normal human being. I know this story because it's a cousin of mine. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And so so these are these are important stories uh, that individuals face. And if and if we take that away from them, then we are not only taking health care or affordability, but we're taking a sense of dignity. We're taking a sense of liberty. We're taking a sense of of security for people to be to live uh, their lives the way they want to live, and this is very important. And I don't think the American people have fully understand, uh, except for those, you know, twenty plus million who have benefited from from the Affordable Care. So, do you think the Democratic Party has failed in telling that story and telling getting that powerful message? that you've brought to us, out to the American people, that this is why Obamacare is is so important? 
Oh man, the Affordable you Care know, Act. I'm 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 new. I'm relatively new. I just uh, this is I'm going now into my third term, uh, and uh, and I can tell you that when I came in, um, there's a lot of members who lost. Uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, so for a lot of senior members, it's uh, it's almost like survival guilt, uh, and so they don't w- they don't want to 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 uh, look at uh, criticizing the Affordable Care Act because that that is the reason why they sacrificed so many members because they helped people, mm-hmm. uh, and so I, I think that that the message that I'm bringing is that. This is not about waving a democratic flag. This is not this is not even about Obama. It's not about Obama. It's not about Obama's legacy. It's not about the Democratic Party. It's not about it's about the people that we are here to serve. It's about the patients that now can go see a doctor. And the 22 million 22 who million will be plus. Out in the cold. But yeah. but uh, Alex that is the message I think right that that the president carries with him yeah. a, a, every day, and I think the Democratic Party has to carry with him in this in this ongoing battle uh, over it, Obamacare. Yeah, and I think it's been lost in these past seven years that we've been debating this. But I, I just wonder now that we're here and the the consequences are real because you do have people who are actually on They're this. They're very real. How do you now tell that story? How do you? You know, not just make it uh, this partisan battle, this this kind of litmus test of Obamacare, well, and see, actually tell those people stories. Well, see, here's 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 my, my my view on this: is that I see myself as an amplifier of the voice of the people, and one of the the the, the most important things that I can do is to empower the people, empower my community. So it is not just me telling my story but if we can empower our citizens if we can empower the the grassroots if we can empower um, families who have been shy to tell their story or who uh, don't really participate in in policy decisions uh, to speak up to call their members of Congress whether Republicans or Democrats tell them how now you can afford that very important medications that is helping you breathe. Uh, tell them how you have noticed that you have saved, seniors have saved on average nearly $2,000 a year and uh, on medications. Uh, talk about this in your churches, in your schools and stuff. Is, is, that, is, I think, is going to be a, a, uh, a, a, a very important strategy. But also, it's um, mem- leaders and people who have the, the honor of, of being able to sit in front of Bill, uh, you know, in the Bill Press show to, to talk about these things need to step it up and do that. And, and, and I think that's what, that's what we need to do. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Richard Conley, Bruce Springsteen, and Mark Marin, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.